Welcome back. back. Welcome to Decision Space, the only show to take place right here in the space between the turns in your favorite games. I'm Brendan Hansen. I'm Jake Friedman. And this is the podcast about decisions in games. And this is the episode about LTF Con. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that is when we get started with the episode. But before that, some very quick housekeeping. I want to start this episode off by giving a shout out to Jim D on our Discord. I know he's been going through a hard time. And if you're in our Discord, you know Jim is one of the most kind of cherished members of our community, helps make our online community what it is. So we just want to say shout out to Jim. We're so glad to have you as a part of this show and community. Yeah. And then we also want to just read out a review. One thing that longtime listeners or short time listeners, if you really enjoy the show, can do to support the show is by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts or anywhere else. So, And we always like to read those reviews off, especially when they're five star reviews. So this week we're reading a review from Oakland Patius titled Favorite Board Game Centric Podcast. The deep dives into what makes specific games tick is what makes this stand out from other board game podcasts, but having a mix of different types of episodes keeps things so fresh and interesting. So thank you so much, uh, Oakland Patius, for that review. And we're sort of thrilled to hear lately all of this feedback that people really like how we've developed a whole suite of formats that we return to uh, with episodes of the show and that that keeps it fresh for y'all. It definitely keeps it fresh for Jake and I too. And I think Today's episode is a testament to just that. We're going to do one of our sort of post-convention mini review recap episodes that we know you you typically love because it's sort of like a, a shovel just bowl, loads of food, of game food straight into your mouth and yeah. ears. And, and we're doing this partly because uh, we have planned Arc Nova episode coming up and we just wanted to give that a little bit more time to kind of cook in the oven before doing our traditional deep dive. So you can look forward to that next week. And then the last thing we want to say in housekeeping is just shout out to our good friend, Aurora, for becoming a patron of our show. If you want to support the show on Patreon, you can do so at decisionspacepodcast.com slash Patreon. It goes a long way to helping us sustain what we're doing here. We, we're really, really happy to have, I think, 32 patron supporters now. This is not a money-making endeavor for us. In fact, we're still... I think what six hundred dollars in the red, <laughs> six hundred dollars in the red. But thanks to, and that's just goes to hosting fees for our website, for our podcast, uh, some editing stuff that makes it a lot quicker for me on the editing end. That we subscribe, but still not all that quick. <laughs> still not all that quick, but yeah. So if anyway, we we should be getting back to even money, and then uh, you know maybe some some slight going upward from there, which would be great. That would allow us to get more games and travel to play games with each other uh, again or more often. So thank you so much, Aurora. I think one of our other patrons bumped their subscription. You know, that means a ton to us. And uh, if, if you want to support us for $5 a month or something, just a tip for the content, what we're doing, you know, the price of, you know, a uh, chai latte with oat milk once a month, uh, it would mean a lot to us. So. Thank you so much, Roar, and thank you so much to all of our patrons who are helping to sustain this show financially. And with that, Brendan, what do you say we get on with the show? So, Jake, what is what's LTF? Yes. So, LTF is my Monday night game group, the Laughing Table Friends, and I've told this story our origin naming story once before on the podcast. But in case you missed it, it's a it's a pretty sweet story. So I'll share it again. So essentially, the Laughing Table Friends is a group of five people. And it was sort of conceived to, to be a game night group for like more serious gamers in our life. And we chose five people intentionally, because that's like, a, if everybody shows up, we can all play one game and have a great time. But if one or two people can't make it in a given week, which happens a lot. Things come up, people are traveling, people are busy for work. Uh, then we still have, you know, three or four people and can still get a solid game in. And we we meet and play games every Monday. And, and it has been a really great experiment uh, and it's gone super well so far. But on our first or second ever uh, convening, we kind of rotate hosting duties and we were playing uh, at my friend Charlie's house. And Charlie has a young daughter named Scout. 
And the next day after playing in our group chat, Charlie had posted in there that in the morning at breakfast, uh, Scout had asked him if the laughing table friends were still there. And thus our name was born and adopted from that. Uh, So that's the Laughing Table Friends origin story. And as I said, it's been a total blast playing with these guys. And we planned uh, to do a LTF con. It kind of coincidentally coincided with Gen Con weekend where we met Friday after work and played till like one in the morning. Typically, you know, we play until 10 or so. And then we two people spent the night at Tyler's house. I fortunately lived close enough that I was able to shuttle back and then back over in the morning to game all day. So it ended up being like something like 18 hours of of gaming over this weekend. We played a lot of favorite games. And what we're going to do in this episode is sort of recap some of those plays, especially the ones that we haven't talked about on this show before. And try my best to keep within the sort of decision space ethos of talking about uh, not just the basics of the game, but sharing a little bit about the decision space what makes it tick. So that's the plan today. And I'm really excited. I'm going to do a quick preview for the for the listeners of some of the games we're going to cover, but we'll keep it teasery. So we're going to cover at least two games designed by a legendary designer who changed board games forever. Uh, at least one game from Rhino Kniss himself, a game by one of the designers of Barrage, some filler games, a deduction game. Jake might share his thoughts on some, some long-loved games that he's returned to and we'll finish with a rondell game Ooh. Ooh, that's good well brendan what do you say we jump right into it with the first game that we played at the con and this was one that i actually uh we sort of rotated through picking duties so this was one that i selected it'd been on my shelf of shame since geekway i picked it up there uh used copy from somebody for 10 bucks and i was excited to try out The Hunger. This is a 2021 release by Richard Garfield, and it's very much Richard Garfield's take on Clank. So the mechanisms are really similar. It's a deck building game where you start out with a uh, base set of cards, and in The Hunger, you're trying to go out from the castle where you start uh, to go through the village and into the forest. uh, And along the way, you're harvesting humans you're feeding on them those are basically the supply of cards that will go into your discard pile to be shuffled into your deck are all humans and the riff here that makes a little bit different is these cards are basically all bad like your starting deck is really strong all those cards are are very good and then you're kind of cluttering it with cards that are going to slow you down uh because they're like human cards that don't there's some ability to combo some of them they're not all human cards you can get familiars that help you but a lot of the cards are humans those are what are worth points and they go into your deck uh, and then they typically don't do anything when you draw them into your hand so you're going out at the end there's a rose you can collect for a bunch of points and then you want to get back to the castle before daylight or you'll be burnt to a crisp and score zero points So this is sort of a classic exercise in hubris. Venture out from the castle, go as far as you can, fill your deck with as much junk slash endgame victory points as possible, and make sure you make it back in time. So it sounds like it's like one part Clank, one part Deep Sea Adventure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, I mean, I think Clank has that Deep Sea Adventure built in. You know, to me, it it felt, I've only played Clank once, just base Clank, and it was quite a while ago, but also from the conversation of people at the table, you know, it felt like this is, you know, very close to this to a similar sort of decision space. I think the big difference there is just in that in Clank, all the cards you're adding, or in my understanding, all the cards you're adding to your deck are better than your base cards and like those are kind of the cards you're wanting to scrap over the course of the game so that is a little bit of a different wrinkle to the deck building mechanic where you start almost as strong as you're gonna be and then get weaker and then you kind of get weaker as you go and you're wanting to scrap try to build in ways to scrap cards that that are you're adding into your deck i think the most interesting decisions that come up is you basically have one value on the card which is how much I think they call it speed. So it's how far you can move. But what you don't spend in movement is also the amount that you have to purchase cards and hunt Mm. with. 
So cool. if I have eight, I could move four and then buy for a value of four. So that was interesting because there was a lot of times on my turn, I found there would be a lot of tension between get to this space because maybe it's a space that lets me call a card from my deck, which I really want to do. But if I do that, then I don't have the you know value left over that I will need to be able to hunt something or, or hunt something that's actually going to help me, you know, the card I want. Uh, so that was that was pretty fun tension. I mean, overall, it's a it's a light, quick game. To me, it it didn't like forty five minutes. We so all I should say all of these games that I'm going to talk about, we played with five, with a few exceptions. Uh, so this was our first one. So we played this before Charlie got here. So we played with four, and as a teaching game, I, I didn't keep time on all these, but I would guess it was probably right around an hour maybe just over an hour with teach so yeah it plays pretty quick i wasn't like blown away by it to be honest i think if you are somebody who likes clank and has played clank before i think you're fine sticking with clank if you know if you want to try a game in this genre i think the hunger is just fine one to try especially if maybe the theme appeals to you and the last thing i'll add about it sort of from the decision space side of things is the end game is different how it resolves in the hunger versus clank where the hunger is very much a set number of turns you know from the beginning of the game that Mm. at the end of turn 15 that's it you know you have to be Mm. back or you die where in clank it's a variable uh so you're like drawing more and more tokens out of a bag and if you hit the critical mass i guess that's the end of the game but you don't you you it becomes more and more likely so you start to get a sense over the course of the game like okay it's probably going to end this turn or next turn but so the, having that i think variable ending does give it a different feel uh and there was a point in our game where one of the players basically you know could see from three turns out they're like oh yeah i'm just dead i'm not making it back my deck does not have the juice right exactly we're in clank maybe the same result but you have like more of a glimmer of hope because it's not 100 percent certain yeah interesting so anyway that's the hunger cool so this next game, Jake, Davide at Imperia, D-E-I for short, is one of the games that I was alluding to as being by one of the designers of Barrage. Uh, it is from Tommaso Batista, and it came out in 2022. And I know nothing about this game besides the fact, Jake, that it is packed full of plastic. There are oh so many God. minis in this game. Yeah. So, and I assume that Richard Garfield is one of is the designer that changed board games forever. Yeah, yeah, that's that you referred to. Yeah, okay, yeah, you got it. Yep. Okay, nice. <laughs> yeah, let's talk about DEI. And okay, I guess so. Tommaso Battista is an Italian designer, right? And which makes sense because probably a English as a first language designer might not choose DEI as the name of their game since it has just like such a like clear. I don't know. You know, like we think of DEI as something that has like a very clear definition and it's also can be kind of like a little bit of a hot button thing so it's just kind of a funny name and uh, it definitely i does should it. say unfortunately a hot button thing but yeah yeah not- well divide at imperia means divide and conquer yeah so yeah yeah pretty pretty different there yeah yeah okay great we got that out of the way <laughs> yeah so anyway this is it was it was actually pretty funny this was uh tyler's first pick and Tyler is a huge fan of Imperium games, like any game that says Imperium on it, he loves. So like Dune Imperium, Twilight Imperium, uh, Imperial, the the contention. Those are like all in his but, top. But these aren't like linked games of all they're, time. They're not like a link series. Well, they're sort of thematically okay. linked, right? And similar. And this one feels like in tone. So divide it Impera. We were sort of saying like it's like it's Imperium in in name. You know, it's close okay. enough. Sure. So that was why I was really excited to play it. He suggested this game as saying it is a riff on El Grande or very much like El Grande. Do you and agree I, with the statement? I'm here to say from the moment I looked at the board, it's just like the board is absolutely massive, like cover the whole table. I wish I could like put into perspective like how big this game is. It's like, so you basically play with, I think it was like something like eight squares stacked together and you have to like put them together in different ways. So you can kind of create the board during setup to, to you know, for variability, right? To change the side of the game. But each of those squares is like half of like a normal board game board. So it's just like this massive board and it's three dimensional. So there's like physical 
structures that like come up off the board. So it does have area majority scoring as like part of the game. And those areas could be like either on the base level or on the second level. And then you can like create bridges that go from like a second level to like a different second level so that you can like move units from one building space to another building space across the board. But all that means like, you know, it creates like this really fun looking structure but to me, as somebody who's like more preferring like Euro games, like that doesn't necessarily like when I like look at the board and I'm, that I'm going to be playing on is I'm not necessarily like super jazzed to see like three dimensional structures and like miniatures all over the place. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Sh- okay, what is the game? So that's just I'm just like I'm setting this. No, no, so for sure. Vibe. I'm with yeah. you. Okay, so the I'm just game, you said it's... area movement. But yeah, it's like this crazy so, city. Yeah, so basically. You have a group, like a squad of people. You'll start with like three or four of them on the board. Uh, And then on your turn, you're playing cards. So I think you have Mm. a hand of like 10 cards, eight cards that are all actions. Uh, And you start with all those cards in your hand. And then each round of the game is like three turns. So everybody will play three different cards. You know, you'll play a card and then everybody will play their first card. Then you'll play your second card, resolve it for everybody. Third, resolve it for everybody. And then I think you do that four times throughout the game. So it does very much fit into the El Grande sort of classification of like, it's not simultaneous, but it is, it is okay. like long term, like a long game with like a few, relatively few amount of like very impactful turns. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the main like thrust of the game is at the end of the second sort of register, right? Every plays their second card. And once you at the end of your resolution of the second card, if you hold two areas that have like a resource cube, there's like three different colors of resources. So if you have the majority in two areas with two matching resource cubes, then you get to like activate one of your technologies that you draft at the beginning of the game. So that's cool. You kind of start to get a little bit of different player powers. Uh, and then those are also worth points at the end of the game. So you really want to like be competing for those areas to make sure you're able to like activate all your technologies by the end of the game. And then alongside that, at the end of the third register, when you finish that, you're putting out a scoring cube on one of eight predetermined scoring cards. And that actually has a really cool mechanism where like each of the scoring cards has like a strong benefit and then like a weaker version of that benefit. And in the first round, you can score the stronger benefit on any of the cards. Uh, And then in the second round, like the kind of active. So basically in the second round, you can score the stronger benefit of any of the goal cards that are in the second, third or fourth row, but not the first. So it kind of incentivizes mm-hmm. you to like score the, a goal in the first row and then the second row and then the third row and then the fourth row to get like maximum points for it. But you could jump ahead if you're like really well positioned to one of the goals, which is like having, you know, a majority in the areas with the green resource cubes, right? If you just happen to find yourself in a situation where you're like, oh, wow, I like happen to be in all five of those at this moment, I could jump ahead, but then I'll have to, you know, lose out potentially on some points later on uh, when I like go back to score a goal from one of the earlier rows. So that's pretty cool. And that's, that's pretty much the game. The scoring is like really simple. You basically get points for your goals. You get points for uh, upgrading your technologies and you get points for like cards. You can buy cards in your hand. Those can be worth points. You can pick up resources. Those are get some conversion to points at the end of the game. And that's pretty much it. So, you know, it does it it did feel a little bit like a super chromed out version of one of of a Kramer and Kiesling design almost like it almost follows in that uh pedigree. The game that it feels much more similar to me than El Grande is uh T Call because it has this like procedural scoring where it's like at the end of my second turn, I check for my technologies and then somebody else can come in and get majority and then they can also get their technology going and the same yep. with points. So that's pretty cool in in that way. It was it was a it was fine. It was a fun experience. I heard it's coming to board game arena. So I wouldn't, you know, I, I think it might work well as sort of like an asynchronous game 
playing live, I definitely was feeling the downtime quite a bit as people were thinking through turns. I think the game probably ran, I think it was something like two and a half hours or so. So not like insanely long, but still like pretty long. Yeah. Any any other questions? I'm trying to yeah. I'm trying to think what else to say. Were there any f- sort of similarities with Barrage that kind of jumped out where it was clear like, oh, this feels like it was designed by one of the designers of Barrage? Did Tommaso's sort of design aesthetic come through or did it just feel so different than Barrage that it's hard to say? Yeah, I didn't. Yeah, to be honest, I didn't like draw any comparisons to Barrage. I didn't know that th- that was sure. the designer Great. when I was going yeah. into it. So I wasn't kind of thinking in that way. I kept just thinking like, this is not El Grande. <laughs> sure. But, which was an expectation set. Yeah. But yeah. Kind of, but like, I do. But there, yeah. I do think like one one thing I would draw from Barrage to DEI for Batista's like he, as a designer, not afraid of giving players long thinky turns. Right. Turns, this is definitely yeah. not micro turn game. I wouldn't say it's a pro- it's not inelegant. Like the thing that made it seem like most elegant is like how clear and easy the scoring is and relatively minimal, which I really appreciated for a game of like otherwise like kind of a grand scope on the table and just like a lot of stuff going on. It it honestly, I think is like less rules complex than Barrage. It just looks like it's going to be a game that has like a lot of like little technical like skirmishy goals there isn't really fighting at all in the game there's like a few ways you can eliminate one of your opponent's figures on the board but generally it's just adding more people to the board and kind of like in again like t call and then trying to like get majorities all all across the board so i don't know it was it was all right uh definitely not my favorite game but i think it looked cool. I'm sure there's a lot of people that are really going to dig this one. And, it, you know, for somebody who's not always really jazzed about area control, area majority games, like that's just generally not for me. I thought it was fine, you know, and I think like a lot of people who like that genre game will find a lot to like, especially in kind of the elegant scoring systems. And that was Divide et Imperia by Tommaso Batista or DEI. All right, Brendan, rolling right along. So the next game we're going to talk about, and this one is a doozy of a game, I have to tell you, and it is Beowulf the Legend by the Rhino Kniz, Rhino Knizia himself, from all the way back in 2005. Brendan, what have you heard about this game? Maybe we should start there. Yeah, okay, so I know that there are multiple Beowulf games by Kinesia, and I believe this is the one that lots of people are interested in. This game also came out during a period of collaboration between Kinesia and Fantasy Flight Games. So this was like the era when they were publishing things like Through the Desert and Taj Mahal, at least in the United States. And I think that this is one of the games that gets mentioned by hardcore Kinesia fans as like, oh, don't miss Beowulf the Legend as a game you should play. Yeah. That's pretty much the end of what I know. Okay. Yeah. I, it's a three to I five player heard. game, I think. Is that right? I don't know. That it's sounds two, right. We BGG played it at says five. two to five, best at five. Okay, great. We played it at five. Yeah. Yeah. So I think what I had heard going into this game is basically that, like, oh, well, I th- and I think this comes from the So Very Wrong About Games podcast, which is that, like, a lot of people had, like, bounced off of this game at the time. But I know, like, that. Mark over on So Very Wrong About Games is a big fan of it. So I think Mm. it is a a bit of a polarizing title. And after playing it, I can absolutely see why. So what this game is, first of all, the board is just hysterical. So it's it's like a board, but it instead of having all four squares of the board, there's just like one removed. Does that make sense to you? It's like it's a yeah, it's like if you had the little the piece in my city that's just three squares. Where yeah, exactly. Two up and one over. Yeah, yeah. It's like a little L. So it yeah, has a whole chunk cut out of the board. But then the middle of that is cut out and it, there's just a giant shield that you put there that does nothing. So what is that look? It's it makes, bizarre. It, it makes absolutely no sense. I haven't seen anything like it. And then what you have on the board is like a path, like Candyland or something that sure. makes it. Yeah, it's just a path. And it that is like the story of Beowulf. So you have a little nice. Beowulf plastic miniature that's going to march on each space and each space you're going to like resolve something. So from that context like the game is always going to play in the exact same path there's no you know skipping over a space or ignoring a space you just will always do 
the exact same thing. And there's probably like 20 spaces or something, which is debatably too many. <laughs> Knizia can be so literal sometimes. Like this yeah. is the literal storyline of Beowulf it's drawn so on this literal. board. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh my uh, gosh. And there are also some... So the the way the game actually plays is it is an auction game. So in it's in a series of auctions, there's two types of auctions. One is a blind bid auction where everybody will play cards out of their hand and you know whoever has bid the most will win and whoever bid the least will lose and everybody in between will you know get their respective places and the way the auctions resolve is whoever wins takes the one piece and then they get to so in each auction space there's basically five outcomes you can get so the person who wins gets their first choice of benefits so they'll get something good but at the bottom you could get bad things too so it, so if you lose an auction you get last place maybe you'll have to take a wound uh, or which is bad because if you get three wounds then you get negative 15 points or you get negative five points for each wound that you've taken over the course of the game or maybe just get straight up negative two points or something like that. So big, a wide range of outcomes. So that's one type of auction. The other type of auction is like an around the table, like clockwise auction. And these work kind of weird. Basically, I guess, and I should say in each of the auctions, there's there's five suits of cards in the game that you're playing with. And each of the auctions will have two suits being like what you're trying to use to win. Like two suits that count and three that don't. So in the around the table auction style, maybe we're trying to use the fox cards and the ship cards. So if somebody will play a fox, then everybody has to play a fox or a ship to equal the value of one. But you can't exceed that value unless you play a single card that has, there, there are some cards that have two, of, two icons on it. So I could have like a fox card that's worth two. So you always have to just match. And then... When it gets all the way around, you can you can then have the opportunity of like playing one more or dropping out. When you drop out, you take the lowest valued token available. So it's kind of in some ways bad to be. So the winning player will then start the next from the last auction starts next auction. And it's typically bad to be that player because, you know, you can if you have to drop out at one right? You've already sort of like expended that. So you play two, then it goes all the way around and you keep going until everybody passes uh, and then you have the winner. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's just kind of, questions. it's kind of funky that like you can't exceed, right? So it's, it's yeah. especially when you're like auctioning with money, it just feels weird that somebody bidding the same amount of money second, like wins. Right. But it's just a rule. It works fine in practice. It's just like a little bit funky to wrap your head around. Yeah. How do you get, okay, are the lots that you're bidding on variable or set? Or is it variable like raw where you get these interesting sort of juxtapositions of this benefit's really good, but this drawback's really bad, or oh, this auction's all benefits, or are they just set based on the board? Brandon, we're playing Beowulf the Legend, so yeah. everything is thematically appropriate with the story. So of course, every so it's like just the, it looks like a circle with like five pie chart pieces. That's just printed on the board. So every time you play this game, every auction is the same auction in a row because we're following the story of Beowulf. So so it will never vary. Exactly. And some of the rewards are thematically appropriate too. So there's like, you lay out like five cards or like 10 cards at the start of the game. And those are rewards for different auctions in the game. So one of the cards might be like four sword icons on it. Or it might be a character card from the story that okay. you can discard for like a one-time effect. So those are like benefits you might be able to win by, you know, selecting in a certain auction. Interesting. Okay. What about and the currency? How do you get more currency? So that those would also be rewards. So basically okay. everything is like you've got cards. Uh, you can get points or money from rewards given out from an auction. And then there are some, some slot, not every single space on the board is a straight up auction some of them are like you could just turn in two swords to get three points here or you can one of the sometimes it's a gold auction so instead of using cards you'll use gold that you've accrued and you're bidding with gold instead is gold victory points they, it's not directly victory points but i think the second to last space on the board is just a gold auction where okay. you just get victory points for it the more gold you spend so you just basically cash out your gold at that point for victory points uh, but it's not like one-to-one -one. and then some of them are just 
I think there's there's one spot that helps you refill cards in your hand, which is you like lay out 10 cards and you draft them into your hand on based on like turn order. Uh, but I didn't explain the most impactful rule of the game, at least in our play, which is that there is a mechanic called risk. So not in every auction, but in most of the auction and some one-time events on the board, you're allowed to take a risk. And if you do that, Again, it'll show two suits where it says risk. So maybe, again, the fox and the ship. And you'll flip over two cards from the top of the deck. Any foxes or ships that show up, you get to add into your hand. And if you fail, you get one scratch. And three scratches, if you get three scratches, you have to turn them in for a wound. Okay, so in that, so sometimes it's just a spot on the board. Everybody can do a risk once and you have a 40% chance of hitting. Okay, because there's two good suits and there's five total suits. But so sometimes it's just one time on the board. That's fine. But sometimes it's within the auction you're playing. Every time around the auction, when it's your turn, before playing a card out of your hand, you can take a risk. And it works the exact same way. So that became a very pivotal mechanism because it's like you get into these situations in auctions where it's like you're four cards in and everybody's already played four cards. So people are like super pot committed. So because you're so committed to like not dropping out, if you have even if you have a card left in your hand to play, you still want to just take a risk because you need to like get more cards, get more cards. into your reserve. Okay. So we had this situation where it's like everybody's doing risk like every time, like multiple times around the table and it created this effect which I can only compare to like dice rolling where it it became really frustrating because you could go into an auction with like six cards in that suit and somebody else maybe has like three cards in hand and they're risking and they're like hit hit it's like okay great and you can also get like critical hits because some of the cards have two of a single symbol so it's I found so I'll just say I did horrible in this game I ended with like negative five points because I could not hit to save my life. Like it'd be like the first player's like taking a risk. They're like, great, I got two foxes. The next person's like, great, I got one. Ch-. As long as you hit one card, you're fine. So maybe it's like, I got one ship. Then player three is like, wow, I got a, the double ship card and a fox. And then it's like me, miss, miss, scratch. <laughs> You know, and then like going around and going around. And it felt to me like the player who did the best on risking won the game because that just was so incredibly impactful. And I def- I definitely didn't play well. It was a really chaotic and like fun affair because every time somebody's doing that and, you know, the same players are getting lucky and everybody's just like, why? Like this guy is going crazy. He's getting, you know, like just like is definitely like a very emotionally evocative mechanism and i realized too late you have to choose your spots wisely you know you can't try to win every single auction like sometimes you might just have to pass early on and take a wound or take negative two points right um, because you want to like save those cards for an auction later but even when i started doing that like a third or halfway through the game and i would like save up for these big auctions like it just didn't matter because even if i was going into it with like a big advantage so basically i saved up and saved up and i had a card that allowed me to like discard it to return a card from my pile to the to my hand that i like played in an auction so i saved up to make sure i won the four sword auction And then two auctions late in the game were involving the swords. And I was like, great, I'll be able to have this sword and compete in both of them. And then like the final auction of the game, which was a really important auction uh, because the last place finisher would get two wounds because it was a dragon fight. I had like six swords going into it. It's like late in the game. Like some players had like two cards in their hand, literally. And I had six swords. I'm like, no way I got last, get last here. And I got last because these because people are just hitting on risks like every single time. The it's like most the odd, heroic. <laughs> the, yeah, right. So I end up, of course, getting last despite being, I think, best prepared going into the auction. Take the two wounds, bring me to a total of four wounds, causing them all to be negative five points. So I get hit with like a massive like 15 point swing. I wasn't going to win even without that happening. 
but it did feel like really frustrating to be like, okay, but even when I like took all these sacrifices to like prepare and prepare and prepare to get as best as I can for this fight, it just like still didn't matter because people were just like rolling, you know, high rolling me just like time yep. after time. And that How felt, long was this? That felt frustrating. 45 was, minutes? No, it was two. It was like at least 90 minutes, I want to say. And that, and that was like, that's my honest like cr- criticism with the game. That's pretty long for Kinesia. I think the risking is fun. And I think if I played it again, I would feel less frustrated because I would go into the game knowing like, okay, this is like a very, a game with an extremely high element of randomness. Not that you shouldn't be planning, but that's not really what you expect when you're going into like a Kinesia auction game. Yeah, At least it wasn't for, sure. for me. Yeah. But yeah, I think it was like too long perhaps just because of, the fact that you're going through this whole story. Like, I don't know that we needed all the auctions. And what it felt like was happening was like, people would just like expand all their cards multiple times and build back up. So it wasn't like you're, there's no like engine or anything, right? So you're not really like doing much like building up over the course of the game. So it kind of felt like we're just kind of like going through this like pattern of play like several times. So it felt like a little too much. But yeah, I mean, the decision space to me, I, t- I said this to people after the game and not everyone agreed, but it felt almost like how I feel when I've played like like skirmish combat games where there is tactical positioning and like you want to position yourself tactically, make strategic moves and you have to do that. But at the end of the day, if somebody just rolls a crit on you, you're done. It doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah interesting. That's well, that's a fascinating game. I'm yeah. really glad to know more about Beowulf the Legend, but I really want to play it again because it yeah. was fun. Like it was probably the most like laughing and just like loudest game we played over the whole weekend. Um, so I, that says a lot, and also because I did so terribly that I want to redeem myself. But yeah, that that is some some kind of crazy board game, and probably not one that's going to become a forever favorite for you. <laughs> I, I don't imagine it would be one that I ever feel like I need to own, but it's totally unique among all the games I played. I haven't played anything like that. Amazing. Okay, we're forty minutes into the show. And I know. Yeah, that, three that went of, long. We got to kick it into turbo. Okay, we're kicking into Turbo. The next game is Clockwork Wars. I've mentioned this briefly on the podcast before. It's an, another one of the area majority area control games. These are a favorite of basically everyone in the LTF crew but me. So I end up playing them often with them. And out of all of these, so this is a 2015 Eagle Griffin production by designed by Hassan Lopez. This is by far my favorite game in this genre Uh, I love it because it plays fast. Basically, everybody has like an order phase where you're writing on paper, basically where you're deploying your rooms to, a la something like diplomacy. Then everything from that is really procedural. You're just kind of resolving fights. There's like some element of where you can like reinforce, uh, so on and so forth. We played the epic game this time where you played nine rounds instead of seven. I never need to play the epic game again. I would always prefer to play the shorter version of this game just because I didn't feel like it added much besides just more length to the play. But yeah, I mean, this is a really fun game. I think the design just gets so much right in kind of like obscuring a lot of the kind of rules that add complexity for, without a lot of uh, payoff. So I, I think I get the most efficient kind of amount of fun strategic decisions of like thinking about where I want to attack, like where I want to commit units, you know, where fights might be here versus all the other games that just are longer, have more rules. I don't know that this game's easy to get these days. Hopefully maybe it'll get reprinted. But if you get a chance to play Clockwork Wars, especially if you like stuff like Blood Rage or Inish or whatever, you know, that style of game where you're trying to take over areas and there's some fighting, Clockwork Wars, that's where it's at. And it's simultaneous choice when you're revealing those order cards. Yeah, so you, you write it down and then you every flips that's them and you cool. just put your units out. And then yeah, it's like, awesome. and it's kind of like, oh no, like there's now there's like a fight here. Like I thought you were going to do this. Or sometimes you could just like yeah. sneak, like every, you think everybody's going to gonna go to one place because it's like really valuable. But then everybody thinks everybody's going there and they don't want to commit units. So you could just like sneak it with like a single unit. And everybody's like, what the hell? Like you did it. You know, nobody That's awesome. contested Jake there. Yeah. So it's it's a really fun game. And it's one of those ones that I like genuinely have enjoyed both of my plays of. Nice. That's awesome. Okay. So that was Clockwork Horse 2015 from Eagle Griffin Games. And, and those now... are really all of the big ones, right? That we were going to talk about. Yeah. 
Yeah. So what, what it, does that mean? So it means it's time for a little filler interlude where we'll touch quickly on some of the filler games that we've played. And I'm looking. I don't know if I have the thing. What the heck? Is this it? No, that's not it. No. <laughs> Presenting the Reiner Knizia Musical Interlude. I was shocked to see that these two games, well, two of the three games that were in our filler interlude are Kinesia. So I saw on our Instagram over the weekend, Decision Space Podcast, you could just search us on Instagram, follow us, it's new, the Jake, that you were playing this Viking Seesaw game, which is literally a 3D physical ship that you're loading pieces onto throughout the course of the game. I saw this, no idea that it was actually a Renner Kinesia game. Yeah, so Jared, J Red Eye in the Discord is famously a huge Kinesia fan. So he's always trying to pick up new Kinesia games and fortunately enough uh, is willing to share them with us. So I think these games were brand new acquisitions. I'm, I'm not sure if they're available here in the US or if he imported them or what. Um, but yeah, there's two games. They come in this like really strangely shaped rectangular boxes. It almost reminds me of like those like pack of gum game size boxes but bigger yeah. just a little bit bigger so yeah viking seesaw is uh you have a big plastic viking ship or i shouldn't say big like it's actually like pretty small like think of like the size of a computer mouse oh wow okay so this is a dainty a dainty it's ship small. a dainty yeah. viking it's ship. A, a small ship that has like kind of a what do you call it? like a fulcrum point in the middle sure. so it can and seesaw back and forth so it can seesaw back and forth and it plays out a lot like Jenga where it's going around the table. Everybody's adding one piece to the side that's in the air. And if you add the piece that tips it, uh, then you have to take some, uh, there's like six of these like cubes in the middle of the ship and you have to take one of those and you're basically playing to run out of all of your starting components. And there are just weird, odd components. There's like, two like bearing size balls one is made out of metal and one's made out of plastic there's like two metal cubes one is gold colored and one's silver colored and like the gold one is like significantly heavier than the others but they're both square and they've got like a big plastic gem thing that's like oddly shaped uh, and maybe one other thing oh you've got like one like strangely shaped meeple as well so you have all these like very similar kind of size things but have different shapes and weights though they're all so small that some of it's kind of interesting where it's like I can tell the golden cube is heavier than the other things, but all the other things that you're playing with like are almost like they definitely have different weights, but the different weight is almost like too Trivial. minuscule to really be able to like perceive by just like picking it up. Like they all just feel like super light. So that was interesting. But you, so yeah, you go around and around and it's pretty fun. The I would I want to be pretty critical of the actual production. Like it's clear that this thing is like really like concessions I think were made to the shape of the box this was put in. And I wish everything was like sized up at least 25%. I think that would just be a more fun and satisfying game because the the seesawing is awesome, right? Like in the at, at its best when you're playing it, it felt like Django where you like put something down. You're like, no way it gets back to me. And then it does. And you put something and you're like, no way it gets back to me again. Right. And then you like start getting that terror when like the next person before you goes and whether they mess it up or not. Like that's great. Unfortunately, like a lot of the play became like because things are just so small and the, the angle it's on is actually like quite steep in the metal stuff. And even the wooden stuff is just like incredibly slick. So it feels like 
you should be able to like stack something on top of things, but they just slide right off into the middle. And then the game basically like if it, there's some rule about like if it falls off into the middle part of the boat, then you can just like replace it. But if you knock something off the boat entirely, then you have to like take it and add it to your thing. But yeah, it felt weirdly like, like I, I think the game would be better if you could like actually set something on top of another piece without it just falling off. And it almost felt like we could get in a situation where there's just not room anywhere. So it's just somebody like trying for like 30 or 45 seconds to like get this block to like stay on it and it keeps like falling Interesting. off. Interesting. So kind of a miss. It, I mean, I had fun with it for like, you know, a, a 15 minute filler, but I, I you know, I'm not going to buy a copy if if this came out as like, a, this is a game that actually needs a colossal edition. Like if a colossal edition of this game came out where you've got like an actual like big boat on the middle of your table and like fun components to play with, then I think it would be an awesome dexterity. Okay. But what about this next one, Jake? Ninja Master. The other Kinesia game. I'll be fair to Ninja Master and say that this was the last game we played and we were pretty loopy when we went to play it. So the way Ninja Master works is that you have eight dice, I think, and you roll in the middle and all the dice show like one of five different colors of ninja on it, a sword icon or a shuriken icon or a puff of smoke in one of the five ninja colors. And then it's like a real time dexterity game where somebody rolls the dice and all the other players have to stand in a ninja pose. And the rule book shows you how I'm doing this for Brendan. Like this is your ninja sure. pose. You're supposed to stand like this, yep. which is basically like you're grabbing your index finger with your one of your hands and pointing your other index finger up in the air which just feels like i'm about to break my finger as i like rush to grab something really quickly and then you have like basically a cage that you're constructing out of popsicle sticks that you roll the dice into to like maintain the dice area and then around that is you put these different colored ninjas so what you want to do is grab the ninja that has the most faces shown so like if six yellow ninja faces show up then that yellow ninja if i grab it is worth six points but if also the uh, the puff of smoke in the yellow color shows up then instead of being six positive points it's six negative points so you want to kind of look really quickly to see what ninjas you're seeing a lot but if you grab it and then it's like oh crap there's the puff of smoke then you actually get negative so that's kind of fun The way the sword works is whoever has the most points has to have the the little wooden sword thing in front of them. And if they if more swords than shurikens show up, then you want to grab the sword. And if anybody if any other player grabs the sword, then you get half of the points of the person who had the sword. They lose half and you gain those which is, I guess, a fun like catch-up mechanism. And then the shuriken is a different thing, and the shuriken just gets passed around, and whoever just happens to have it in front of them, they get bonus points equal to however many shurikens are rolled. So that's really a really weird rule to include <laughs> in a game, I think. It makes no sense to me, but you know, I'm not Rhino Kaniz, so who am I to say? All right, so we learn this rule, and we go to play it, and we roll the dice, and the first thing that happens is somebody, we just like all grab stuff and just like absolutely destroy the little popsicle stick structure. And then all the dice are like messed up and like re rolled. <laughs> I wish we had on video because it was so comical. Like everybody was trying to grab, like colliding, just like absolutely like blowing up the whole middle of the board. So, and that happened like multiple times. Like, I don't know how it could like not happen honestly like people are just trying to like grab across from each other and it's kind of frustrating because it's like if you got something good and then it's like oh but somebody else like just like clumsily knocked into everything then you just kind of like well yeah. it's like a do-over so that kept happening to the point where we like grabbed a different dice tray to use rather than like the popsicle stick thing that was included and that helped a little bit but honestly like I don't know about this one at all. It it was a miss for me. It, you know, out of the two, I think Viking Seesaw is was much more fun. Okay, but it looks like you also played Cockroach Poker. Yeah, and then we played Cockroach Poker as as our other filler game. That was really fun. Uh, this was my first experience with Cockroach Poker. Um, basically, you draw a card off the top of the deck. There's like eight suits, and you hand it to somebody, and you say like this is you you pick one of the suits. And you either say it is that suit or you say it's or you you pick a suit and you say this is a cockroach or this is a stink bug. And then they get to can either call or pass to somebody else. If they call, they can say 
they can agree or disagree. They can say, yes, it is a cockroach. And they flip it over. And if they're right on the call, then the person who passed it to them has to add the card to their kind of tableau in front of them. If if they're wrong, then the person who has made the call adds it in front of them. And you just play that way. Or, or they say, pass. And if you pass, then you get to peek at it. And then you pass it to somebody else. And you're allowed to change what it was. You could say, oh, Brendan sent it to me and said it was a cockroach. But he lied. It's actually a bat. And he sent it to them. And now that person has to make a call to be like, is this a bat or is it not? But it was a cockroach all along. Maybe. Exactly. Yeah. And it, so it was, it was really fun and it basically goes until somebody has one of each card or four of the same card or if you lose you have to start so if i think it, it's rare but if neither of those conditions are met and somebody has to start a hand and they have no cards left um, and this is a game with one loser lose. not a winner yeah it's a game with one loser which which is always fun too and it kind of can create some like momentum around the table we had some fun kind of like mind games going where luke i think had three bats or something so somebody hands me a card that's like this is a bat for luke and i look at it and it's like it is a bat and i hand it to somebody else who's not luke and i'm like this is a bat for luke yeah yeah. and then they look at and you kind of wanted to send it around to everybody else first because if you're the last person you can never pass it back to somebody who's already seen the card so if you're the last person to get it you're forced to make a call at that point so it's kind of like we're like trying to like manipulate in such a way that like luke would be the one have to have to make the call it's kind of fun how it emergently sets up this like chain of lying to your friends like normally when you're like bluffing in games like that right it's just kind of like i will make a bluff and then everyone else at the table has to read me whereas with that setup you can create these like chains of some people are in the know and some people aren't, but then they might become in the know and then it recontextualizes everything. It seems like this was by far your favorite filler of the three. Yeah, oh, by far, yeah. And I like this one a lot. I think it's compared to Skull in the same way. And this one I I, I liked much more than Skull, which to me always feels like both too tense and also too little agency. Yeah. Where here it feels like you have more ability to kind of be flexible, manipulate the game and also just like have fun. And it it doesn't like take... Like Skull's almost like too short, right? Because if you feel like, oh, if I mess this up, then that's like halfway to victory for somebody else. Or I lose one of my like four things that I have as resources were here. It felt like it was just a little bit more playful uh, and cool. Fun. That's awesome. I have not played Cockroach Poker yet, but I would love to. That's when I, I need yeah, to just snag it. It's like $5. Totally. Yeah, it's one I would recommend to anyone. I think you could play with anybody. It's totally a family game, totally, but also worked great with our quote unquote, serious re- gamer convention. Weekend. Well, and one thing I learned, so one learning takeaway, Cockroach Poker is actually designed by Jacques Jaimet, who's also the designer of Ghost Splits, another sort of notably notable party-ish game. Uh, so yeah, that's pretty cool. I'm glad you got to play at least one filler game you really dug. We're kind of running up on time. So I think maybe we'll get rid of one of the games that we have listed here, which we can touch on in our future social deduction Great episode but there are two other games that i want to just touch on really briefly hopefully the listeners will indulge us to hear about two more and the first of those is the second richard garfield game of the weekend old garfield couldn't overtake reiner canizia as our most played designer he got but close. pretty impressive number two with two plays and this game is robo rally from 1994 brendan have you played robo rally i have not but i know a lot about robo rally because famously this is the game that richard garfield when he went to peter atkinson the owner of wizards of the coast in the early 90s he was going to pitch robo rally and peter atkinson said to him i can't make a board game but i could make a card game and then Richard made Magic the Gathering, blew up, and then they were like, well, we'll make Robo Rally now. We can afford it. <laughs> that's amazing. I didn't, I, had, I didn't know that story. That's, that's such a great story. Yeah. So Robo Rally is a, a programming game where you're trying to complete a race with a robot. And the way the game works is you draw nine cards off the top of your deck. And those cards have simple instructions to your robot, like move forward, move forward twice, do a right turn, you know, so on and so forth. And then you have to, you'll play five of those nine cards face down. As soon as you're done, you flip over the 30 second timer uh, and say, I flip the timer. And then everybody has to finish playing their cards. Or if they don't, just add cards randomly from the top of their deck uh, to mess them up. And then you'll resolve each of those 
cards, one register at a time. So everybody will resolve their first card. So maybe I'm going forward one, you're turning right, whatever. And then you activate the board. So the board has like conveyor belts or lasers that if you're stuck on, it will deal damage to you or move you to potentially, uh, you know, hopefully you plan for that in your programming phase. Uh, but also you can, you know, run into somebody else's robot, which they likely didn't predict. And then before you know it, they're on a conveyor belt heading straight for a hole in the ground and they'll have to start over. So you basically just do this. You, there's a simple like upgrading phase where you can, you start with some resources and there's ways to get extra resource cubes if you land on those spaces. Or one of the cards in your deck, I think, just gives you a resource cube uh, so you can add fun stuff to your deck or to your robot, which is like, oh, my my robot by the end of the game had lasers that dealt two damage and damage means you just have to add like spam cards, they're called, into your deck, uh, which is going to clutter up your hand, make it less likely you can do the movements you want. Uh, and my laser also bumped people one space. So that was really fun. I actually got to play Kingmaker, but in a really fun way where I was, we played to two checkpoints. So I hadn't even got the first checkpoint because I'm an idiot and could not manage. <laughs> it's also a really chaotic game. <laughs> it's really chaotic, but I just like shot myself in the foot where I was like, thought I would be somewhere where I just was not. And then I was just like doing the wrong thing. So instead of going for the checkpoint, I turned around, turned left, and just sniped somebody who was literally on the flag, pushing them one space and then causing them to like basically get totally screwed over. And the next, the person who was kind of coming in second place ended up winning the race, which I felt great about. <laughs> I don't know. If the, I don't know if the would be winner felt so good because literally sitting on the flag and we had to look up in the rule book like, how does this resolve? Does he just get it now or does it happen at the end of ev the register? And it was the latter. So he got bumped off it. But yeah, that's Robo Rally. It's a super fun, light, family See what style happens game. game. What? Yeah. See what yeah. happens. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah it, it's fun. It's chaotic. I mean, somebody is going to end up just getting totally hosed. And then, you know, it definitely has a snowballing effect once you've got a bunch of damage in your deck and then you can't do anything that you wanted to. The good recommendation with this one is like, don't try and do a long race. Cause I yeah. used to own this game. Actually, the copy we played was a copy I had given to Tyler. So he saw it in my going out pile. There, the game comes with a bunch of boards. So you're kind of like, be like, oh, I want to like set up a big race to do like multiple boards. Like, do not do that. <laughs> Play the small version. We played a small yeah. board and we had two different checkpoints on it. And that was about perfect, if not like just slightly too long. But yeah, it was a it was a it was a total blast. So definitely recommend, you know, if you get the chance to check out this old school Richard Garfield game. It's still fun today. Yeah. And that's Robo Rally. Jake, I'm really intrigued about this next one. Can I introduce it? And then you yeah. can run me through your thoughts. Okay, so we have been on a Mac Gertz kick for a while, though Mac Gertz is a designer of games like Imperial 2030, Concordia, Navigador, and also Transatlantic, but well known for his first design, w which was a Rondell game that came out in 2005. Antique? Is that how you're, how are you pronouncing it? Antica? I think Antica. But we, Antica. But surely Antica 1 came out before Antica 2. Right. And Antica 2, which you both played, which y'all which actually played, came out in 2014. Oh, so it's revisiting. Now I'm understanding the notes. Yeah, yeah. It's revisiting <laughs> Antica with Antica 2, a yeah. follow-up game in 2014. Got it. Okay. Yeah, so we played Antica 2. Um, and this is, I, I guess, almost a civilization game feel. Yeah. Uh, you start out with, you know, a couple of cities on one part of the map. I think the map we're playing is like large, is is like essentially the It's the Mediterranean. Mediterranean. It's like the Fertile Crescent type. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of hard to like know like where places are because I'm pretty sure it's in Roman-esque script or something. It's like, what are these places? Is it not, Brendan? No, it's the Mediterranean. You got it. You're you're doing great. Okay. You're yeah, like, yeah. you're like, it's like saw you like squinting. I was, I was just was laughing because I got my starting cards. Like, okay, put one of your cities in each of these three places. And I'm just like squinting at the board. What are these things? But I found them and got there. Basically, the way the game plays is you have a rondel, very much like Imperial 2030, if you played that or remember our discussion of it. I think there are like eight spaces on the rondelle and you can move between one and three spaces in each turn or pay a resource to move further for each resource you spent. Uh, the actions are all super simple. It, it really felt like streamlined, simplified Imperial 2030 in the way the actions worked. You're basically getting 
gold, marble, or iron. Those are three of the resources. And you get one for each of your city that cities on the board that produce that resource. Plus, every, and I really like this as just like a nice feel good thing that kept things speeding along nicely, which is every single time you produce any resource, you also get one wild resource in addition to it. You can also take an action. There are two action spaces to move your units. This is how you would like attack people's territories or temples. There's buying units for iron. There's buying temples for marble. There's uh, doing scholarship for gold. And uh, there might be like one other action space, but maybe not. Um, <laughs> uh, but that that very much the, the thrust of the game. You're just doing one of the simple actions. It's, it's super micro turn feel where it's just whipping around the table really quick because it's super easy to pre-plan what you're going to do with your next action. Um, and typically, you're, I, I felt a lot of the decision space for me was sort of around, I was going for a military strategy. Uh, so I really wanted iron. So it's a lot of it was like, how do I get back to that iron space quickly? Because I was like generating a lot of resources and able to use them uh, and, and figuring out like, you know, the nuance of making my way between the iron and the buying units and the moving units and trying to do that in an efficient way. Um, I ended up taking over like so many territories on the top of the board to build out my economy. But while I was doing that, other people were boosting their economy with temples, which if you get a temple that helps you produce like three times the resource there and doing scholarship, uh, which basically gives you tech that, that makes you more efficient as well. So those are kind of the three, I think, main strategic paths, military, temples, and scholarship. The How way the Oh, the way sorry. the game works is you're, it's a race to eight points and there are and there are all these different achievements that you can be getting uh, which each score you one point. Uh, so like the scholarship's really interesting because each scholarship, each tech that you would research has two different costs, a higher cost and a lower cost. If you're the first person to do it, you get an achievement for researching it, but you have to pay the higher cost. And then anybody else who wants that can pay the lower cost. So that was really cool because somebody would be like, all right, I'll pay the nine coins to, you know, get this enhancement. Uh, and then it it made a lot of sense thematically because then it's like once it's been researched, it kind of like opens the doors for like other civilizations to like start using that technology as well. And you get it for the cheaper cost. So that was really cool. Other achievements are for like controlling every five cities that you control. You get an achievement. So I got up to like 10 so I had two of that achievement. You get an achievement for destroying somebody's temple, which basically requires moving into a space with an excess of three units. So you remove the temple and those three units. Uh, and then you get a point for that. You get a point for sea supremacy, which I think is just like having a boat in eight regions on the sea, or maybe it's like seven. Um, and a couple other things too. And I mean, it was it was really fun, a really quick game. I don't think it could have possibly played in more than 90 minutes. I felt as though in my play that going the military route, that my economy was just like so far behind everybody else's who were going for the temples and really like enhancing their income uh, way more. But one thing I had misunderstood in the rules, because I think because of the way the temples work, you remove it from the game. I thought that like taking over somebody's city, you would like remove yeah, their city it. from the mm. game. But in reality, you just keep that city and like add it to yours. Like you replace it with your own city. So I was not as like the biggest military faction on the board. I wasn't pushing out into other people's. I was just trying to like claim my own area. And I think that if I were to play it again, you know, realizing the double benefit of not only slowing down somebody else's economy, but like adding to your own is a necessary check on that sort of like temple, just like building up your own uh, economy strategy. So I would definitely play things differently if I played it again, but it, it was it was definitely a fun one uh, and one I would love to try again. My initial impression is I liked it much more than Imperial 2030 just because it was fast. The decision space was more apparent and intuitive on like what you were trying to do to like advance your game where it felt like an imperial 2030 that like separation between you and the faction kind of made things really opaque at a lot of times you're like what do i even need to be doing in this situation to help me on tika 2 you know you are the faction right, right. so it, 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 that obfuscation is totally gone 
Uh, and that made it, I think, really fun as a first play. The only like criticisms I have for it are the fact that it's just like the board itself is just like, it, you know, it, this is like the Mediterranean. It's, a, it's bland. Yeah, yeah, it's the theme and board could not be more bland. And the, th- the board like oddly looks like it's like in low resolution or something like there's these like laurels on the victory track that are, look like they're way less resolution than the rest of the board. And, and there are other like things on the board, too. Like even the Rondell spaces itself is just like what happened here? It looks like late 90s Photoshop, not 2014 graphics. Yeah, design. yeah. I'm like surprised that. It, it feels like, yeah, 20, yeah, 2005 would make more sense for the yeah. design than 2014. And maybe they were trying to preserve the feel of the of the original. I don't know. Sure. Yeah. And, but all of that, I mean, that's like, that's the, the set dressing, which did nothing for me. Maybe some people like that kind of like old school Mediterranean civ building vibe. And, and it would, you know, that's always going to be subjective, like the theming. But the gameplay itself, I, I felt like super solid. I think Renan... You would love it if you got the chance. I would yeah. highly recommend it to you, as I would for our listeners to check out Antika 2. There's a dual version on Yukata. Maybe we should play it. Antika 2 Duel? Yeah, uh, Antika Duel. Oh, interesting. Antica, I didn't... Yeah, it's like a dual variant that came out before Bruno Cathalo was like making all of his dual games. What? Matt, Matt Gertz made one. Oh, yeah. interesting. Yeah, I would, I would definitely be down to check that out. Well, but yeah, that's that's pretty much it. We played a few other games than that, but it was a super fun weekend with the friends. Tyler, thanks so much for hosting. Jared, Luke, Charlie, thanks so much for being great sports. And uh, as always, had a total blast playing games with you guys. And thanks so much, Jake, for regaling us with the Tales of the Laughing Table Friends Con. Next week, for all of our listeners who are pre-planners, we're going to cover Ar- Ark Nova in a deep dive. That one's a behemoth. Uh, So Jake and I will share our thoughts on one of the, I think, most celebrated games of the last three, four years. Uh, So get excited, get ready. It's on Board Game Arena if you'd like to give it a whirl first. As always, you can learn uh, more about Decision Space by going to decisionspacepodcast.com. Make sure to follow us on our Instagram. Just search Decision Space on Instagram and you'll find us. It's brand new. And thank you to Hembry for our intro and outro song, Reach Out. Until next time. Bye. Bye, y'all.